One of the strengths of Anaheim is the richness and diversity of the faculty. Um, I have with me uh, Dr. Kathy Bailey and, and Dr. Rod Ellis. Um, in addition, uh, we have uh, Dr. Martha Clark Cummings and, and Dr. Ruth Weinberg. We all have contrasting styles and different philosophies of, of education and teaching. And uh, rather than being a weakness, uh, this is a strength. And in the evaluations from the students, they're constantly referring to the fact that uh, they enjoy this contrasting style. Um, I wonder what uh, your, your philosophy, I guess, differs from mine in that uh, you're more committed and, and given, the, given the nature of the subjects that you teach, uh, particularly second language acquisition, that uh, you provide an input rich experience for the learners. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about your, your philosophy of, of instruction and particularly online instruction. Well, let, let me first of all say that I think the online classes play an extremely important role in the Anaheim program. Um, it brings the students together. Uh, it's where they can interact together. Uh, they get to meet their professor uh, once a week. Uh, and my experience is that that is part of the program that they in particular value. Yeah? That's when they meet me. In addition, they're going to spend a lot of time um, engaging in different types of readings, different types of tasks which they have to post on the discussion forum. Uh, so my own feeling is that probably what they want to know when they meet me is what I know about a particular topic. On the other hand, I don't lecture. It's impossible to lecture online. Um, what you have to do is to use a variety of techniques to get through a certain amount of content. And that's what I try to do. So the techniques that I use are sometimes to ask them to produce definitions of key concepts, uh, sometimes to ask questions, uh, sometimes to invite them to ask questions, etc. Uh, et but yes, I think I'm with them for an hour. And uh, my own philosophy is, if, is, if you like, that uh, during that one hour, they probably uh, want to know uh, what I can lead them uh, to understand about the particular topic of the day. I mean, what's the sense of lecturing online? You may as well just give them a copy of the lecture and send it to them electronically. So online classes have to be interactive, yeah? So the issue, perhaps, is how much you are going to uh, lead the interaction that takes place, how much you're going to try to direct the issues and topics that are going to come up during that online class. And in that respect, yes, I do have an agenda that I want to get through in an online class, and um, I try to get through it. My own feeling is that the, uh, the online classes provide um, as much a form of kind of social cohesion and connectedness for the students as, as content transferal, and that uh, that's probably almost as important a function, maybe a hidden function, of the, the, weekly, the weekly online sessions. C Kathy, what about you? I mean, what, what's your philosophy, and, and how has your teaching changed as a result of your becoming an online teacher? I think the hardest thing for me about being an online teacher has been trying to figure out how to be funny online. Yeah. Mm. Because when I teach face to face, I think I'm extraordinarily funny. You are. You. I'm, I'm actually brilliant. <laughs> I'm a great comedian. You humble see, I just too. made you laugh. Humble, yes, very humble. humble. <laughs> and and trying to communicate enthusiasm online has been mm -hmm. a really interesting challenge. Mm -hmm. And trying to be funny online. So, one of the things that's changed for me teaching online is that I've had to. Um, sort of encapsulate a few little mm -hmm. routines mm -hmm. that I know are both subject matter appropriate and entertaining right. and use those somehow in the lessons. Right. And it's still a challenge for me. Sometimes when I've popped into your class and we mm -hmm. start kidding with each other online, the students, yeah. I, I receive emails from the students saying how much they enjoy that kind right. of uh, right. that repartee. Right. And, uh, you weren't just there supervising, you were really there for the repartee. I was really there for the repartee. Yeah. Good. I was really there to steal your jokes. <laughs> I guess another thing that I believe in on an online class is pace. Mm, mm, mm. You know, I mean, they're going to be with you for one hour. And given that you are, uh, given that the conversation that you're actually having is written, and given that, given that writing is a product that you can actually see, mm -hmm. yeah, you don't really have to worry too much about pace because people can always read back or read the transcript afterwards, mm. etc. So you don't really have to worry about keeping things moving. Right. And that is a very important part of my own sense about running an online class. Mm. I'm not worried about humor 
I mean, like you, when I teach face well, to face. Not fun. <laughs> I think I'm very fun. Uh, I rest my case. <laughs> Uh, my students think I'm funny. Uh, um, <laughs> don't they? They yes. are. Okay. Uh, but I, but I, I, I have never really tried to be funny online mm. because I haven't worked out a way to do it. And um, I think there are other things you can do better online than try to be funny. One of which is to get some pace into the lesson and, and mm. to get through quite a lot, mm. etc. So, so I do that, and then they meet me in the residential, and they realise that I'm. Really, 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 really love a nice, a really, a really funny, <laughs> wacky guy. All right. <laughs> well, that was funny. <laughs> <laughs> you earned that one. <laughs> See, they're all laughing. <laughs> well, on that note, um, I think that uh, I'll allow my colleagues to go and have a well-earned cup of coffee. But uh, as you can see. The, the richness and diversity of the faculty uh, shows through in this little clip and uh, is an important ingredient in the, in the success of the program. Probably the single most important ingredient in the success of the program has been the, the quality of the, the stellar academics that I've been able to attract to now the program. Now you're being funny. <laughs> David is very flexible. David has his, has his own ideas about what is the best way to teach online, but he doesn't necessarily think that that is the best way for everybody. Uh, which I think is the point that he's just been making. Exactly. So one of the, one of the one of the things that makes David a pleasure to work with is that he lets you get on and do things in the way that you think is going to work best for you, mm -hmm. and uh, that's what good directors do. They don't tell people how they should teach; they encourage them to work out ways that are most effective for them. Yeah. Well, that's been my philosophy as a teacher trainer for many years. That um, I say to my uh, I've said to my, my, my trainees that um, there is no one best way, there's no one, one best method. Each, the, the, the trick to being a successful teacher is to evolve your own method. Um, so we've got you know, the Rod Ellis method, the, the Kathy Bailey method, the David Unit method. <laughs> so, but um, the, the other thing I wanted to um, briefly talk about was, was uh, where we're, we're taking the, the program into the future and the faculty into the future. And one of the exciting developments is uh, the uh, the, the doctoral program, which uh, which Dr. Ellis is going to be um, I, I, largely responsible for, <laughs> which is very exciting because he's had a great deal of experience as a, as a doctoral uh, supervisor in a number of continents and uh, different contexts and countries, and so we would be able to draw on a great deal of strength and, uh, and experience and wisdom in, in setting up the doctoral program. Maybe 10, 15 years ago, people would have got their MA and that is as far as they would have expected to go, but things are changing. And increasingly, people are looking to get a PhD, partly for career purposes, but also for curiosity purposes. Um, and it seems to me that if Anaheim doesn't have an MDD, that it is not really going where I think the market is going, which is increasingly towards MDD, uh, doctoral level uh, studies. Um, I mean, one of the things I've noticed at the uh, at, at University of Auckland is the sheer number of applications that we get for doctoral study. We mm -hmm. get over 100 a year now, yeah. which we can accept a very small number. So there's a, there's a huge market out there. But I think it's also a very interesting challenge to develop an effective EDD uh, that is going to be mounted online. I don't know, for example, of any online EDD in our field. Now, when you initially established the MA, it was, if not the first, one of the first in the whole area. And I think the same is going to be with the EDD. But I think it's going to be a challenge. Yeah. I mean, one thing I'm beginning to wonder is how are we going to develop the statistical sophistication that we might need in people doing an EDD? Um, and that's something I'm beginning to think about. Kathy, what, what's your feeling about the ADD? I, my own feeling is that one of the biggest challenges f as an administrator is going to be um, evaluating, identifying and evaluating appropriate candidates you know, from, the, from the many applications that we'll have because um, it does take a special type of person to, to succeed online, um, either at master's, master's level or at, or at uh, doctoral level. And uh, being able to to ensure it in some senses from an application who is going to succeed right. and who, is not, who, who, who right. may not succeed is going to be, I think, one of the big challenges. Right. One of the points we discussed last night, and I think this is a very important point, 
is that when we move to FDD, we should, we, we, we should proceed to recruit a cohort and we teach a program as a cohort because I think that that is going to simplify things enormously. I don't think it's going to be possible, initially at least, to have an FDD program where you can have people kind of joining every semester. So I'm, I'm, I, I feel very strongly that we need to take the notion of a cohort, which will be recruited to start at a particular time, and then we take them through. And maybe we recruit one cohort each year or one cohort every 18 months, so there could be two cohorts uh, in action at any one time. But I'm, I, I feel very strongly we need the cohort concept. Exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. And that's in fact the way that it runs, for example, in Hong Kong, the, the FDD, they, 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 they even though they're face-to-face, -face, they, they bring in these cohorts and they provide mutual right. support and, uh, and help to each other as they right. move through, through the program. And I think that mutual support uh, is one of the reasons, and we've worked very hard on this uh, with the MA students over the years, and I think it's one of the reasons for the very low attrition rate. I mean, one of the, thing, one of the hallmarks of distance learning traditionally has been the very high attrition rate. We've had a very low attrition rate over the years, and I think it's because the, the students do develop a sense of, of, of co-responsibility and, um, and there's also that sense of mutual support. There have been times when a student has been tempted to, to withdraw from the program because of the pressures and so on. Um, and the other students help them through right. uh, those difficulties and encourage them to, to stick right. with it. And that is even more important than FDD. Mm, absolutely.